I'm Dana Hahnklein here with Tom McGrath and Ramsey Naito for The Boss Baby. You guys definitely utilize the dichotomy of sort of some very adult physicality, but on a baby's body. Uh, you know, there were a lot of sort of micro actions. I saw. I was like, yep, I do that, and I do that, and I do that when I'm in the office. So I'm wondering if there was anything that was sort of almost too weird to do, where you just, just went, oh no, that's not right. I think the animators had a lot of fun because we, we studied a lot of business techniques of how businessmen conduct themselves. And one of them is called holding the volleyball. And when they do meetings, you know, and there's all these little hand gestures. There's, we looked at, uh, you know, p politicians for certain hand gestures they do when they speak. And uh, there is a duality to Boss Baby. There's one point in the movie where he turns it, reverts into a normal baby. It's not a spoiler. But because of the, the days of um, uh, YouTube and all those things, we were able to look at, like, baby's first fireworks, where, you know, it's babies reacting to a firework going, you know, and we were able to capture these moments, and in, in, in the animators had just a, a ball playing with the duality of Boss Baby. And they're, you know, most people don't know this, but we record all the dialogue beforehand. And, we, and Alec is inspired so many animators, whether it's facial expressions or gestures he did as well, and everyone leveraged off his performance, which was beautiful. You know, we really played with the, the juxtaposition of this baby and the corporate culture. Like having a baby adjust his tie or, you know, pull out his, his shirt cufflings. It was a lot of fun for everyone. The only thing um, we couldn't do, we pixelated out. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that was the first right, time <laughs> I've seen pixelated. Yeah. <laughs> In a kids-ish movie, you know, like, there is partial nudity. There it's is just a baby bottom. How much bottom is too bottom? Is, too much bottom is the question. Uh, you're allowed two cheeks. Really? Yeah. Full, but full cheeks. Uh, two full cheeks. Yeah. Okay, good to know. If that's the song, so. <laughs> cheek to cheek. Yeah. Which is in the movie. Yeah, which is in. I gotta ask, when you set out to make this film, did you realize that this is going to be the second most famous role that Alec Baldwin plays with someone with tiny hands? No, what's the first? Donald Trump. Oh, of course, yeah. 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 Oh, you know, yeah. The great thing is, and it's so funny, because you know, we, we started this years ago, six years ago. Right. You know, and who knows who's going to be in office whenever. Sure. But it's just like, it's a testament to Alec Baldwin and just how his comedic side is great. Here's an actor who started very dramatic and then just found his comedy, and he's one of the best comedians. And that's why we loved him for our movie, because there are times when he needs to be dramatic, and then times where he's just the star of the show, and he's, he just... He just knows where the joke is. He's, he's so professional about it. And he gave us his all. I mean, uh, he's the hardest working man in show business. Obviously, not only can he finish our movie and he's off doing Saturday Night Live or whatever he's doing, and he's just, you know, he's got so he always brings this great energy to anyth anything he does. Short limbs, cartoony animation, probably a little challenging sometimes. Uh, what were <laughs> some of the challenges for your animators, for your rigging team? One of the challenges was baby fat, cheek jiggle. We had a team of scientists working around the clock to create algorithms for the perfect uh, balance of baby fat. And it, it's no joke. I mean, it was like, you know, every film has its challenges and ours is just like, because there's a quality to it that every parent knows. And, uh, and so it was really kind of capturing that. You ever do like a 40 remaster, like the baby smell, smell of vision? Like, yeah. smell <laughs> that'll be your like, next <laughs> like new baby smell. Yeah. Baby <laughs> There's still time for scratch and sniff. Yeah. There we go, yeah. <laughs> Tie in stuff. Blackbird is one of my favorite Beatles songs oh. of all times, and sometimes I feel like it's yeah. super underrated, but Beatles are such a hard catalog to get the rights for. So I'm curious if it was always going to be Blackbird, or if at some point you guys tried other music, or? No, Blackbird was always the one, and yeah. it was our writer who, who used to sing that to his, he has four kids, and used to sing it to his kids. And then the more, you know, and so we we thought we were going to originally write a, a lullaby for the movie, but it was hard to the be. more we talked to parents and more people that worked on the show, it was like, I sing my son or daughter that song every night before bed, and we didn't know how many people use that song as a lullaby. So we were very fortunate to get the music and pitch the movie and the idea of the movie and got the rights to it, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful lullaby, really, mm -hmm. you know. It's so it's multi generational. My mother sang it to me. I sang it to my kids, and anyone on almost everyone on the show they sang it to their kids. So it's and story wise, it was important because it represents everything the kid feels he gets from his parents, all the love, all the adoration. So he kind of holds on to it really tightly. And it's then, his song. And we use it as a as an example of him kind of stepping up to be the older brother later in the movie. I don't want to give it away. Uh, one of the things I loved was the like the the parts that are sort of subjective to Timmy's mind and like his imagination, because I thought it was such a great visualization of like how we imagine things as kids, and sometimes we forget that as adults, so it's nice to sort of see that again. But um, how how was it combining the two styles? Yeah, I mean, I was a huge fan of like Maurice Noble and, and old design animation, you know, when it was painted, and and, uh, and we knew we had 
we wanted to do something special. And I think on Madagascar 3, we did a sequence that was very abstract, like Pink Elephants on Parade, thought, oh, it would be great to do more of this. And you bring up this point. I think as, as, as we grow older, we forget about our imaginations. And uh, Dr. Seuss, Ted Geisel, had a great quote. He said, uh, um, adults are obsolete children. And you forget about what it was like. And you know, when you're asking me about, like, is there anything from your past? My brother and I played in our woods together, and it was either a prehistoric world or a, a, a planet far off in space. And we always played together with our imaginations. And so we thought this is a special part of the movie that we, we want it to look and feel different. It's my favorite aspect of the film is the fantasy. And you know, for me, reading the script, it was a complete awakening of a time where you know, for myself as a child, I would, I would fantasize. But also with my kids, it's something they can relate to now. I mean, my, I have a seven-year-old who, who falls into his fantasies, and he's the hero in whatever he's imagining, just like Tim. So it's, it's great. Yeah, and they are little films within the film. So yeah. we actually created our own separate pipeline with a team of artists that were just the uh, heightened reality team that kind of created, uh, led by Andy Schuler. Um, all the fantasy moments, so they would all kind of feel the same and look the same and be, uh, you know, reflect Tim's imagination. One of my randomly favorite characters was Wizzy. Oh. Yeah, Wizzy. What, what's up with Wizzy? Like, where did that come from? <laughs> Wizzy is one of the joys in working with animation. <laughs> it's the same way in Madagascar the Penguins came out. They weren't written into the original yeah. script, but they become a drawing that then all of a sudden has a line or two lines and grows. And, and, um, and the story artist drew this wizard alarm clock because he th thought the kid should have one. And I went home for the holidays, and my nephew does a spot on Ian McKellen, and it would leave the answering messages for me. And it's like, oh, it'd be great if this clock had a voice. And so we brought him in, and we started writing more and more lines for him. And, and it felt apropos, like the kid, his only friend is his alarm clock, and his only confident, confidant. And, um, and it just became a really fun character. Yeah. I loved him. What's great is he becomes like a window into Tim's emotion. Yeah. You know, and you really get a get a, a, a understanding of where he is in the story. So yeah, and wants to settle everything with a great curse. Yes, don't we? We shall not cross. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. Congratulations hey, on the film. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Oh. Yeah. There you go.